So I'm gonna get started. It's gonna be a, it's a quickie, so it's only about 15 minutes. I'm gonna go as fast as I can. Just kidding, no, I try not to. But uh, my name is Ray, I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. Anyone here used the Google Cloud before? All right, quite a few. You don't count, Iliad, you work for Google. <laughs> but if you have any questions, uh, you can contact me on Twitter, at Satanism. And this is not recorded, right? Uh, if it's not recorded, I can say, if you don't like what I'm saying here, you can find me on Google+, Plus and because uh, you'll probably never use it, and I don't use it either, so anyways. <laughs> So what happened is I joined Google about three and a half years ago as a, uh, as a developer relations uh, engineer. And then I became a developer advocate, which then I got to go travel everywhere to kind of speak about you know, our uh, technology and you know, connect with the developer. And one of my biggest debut was about uh, two years ago in 2015 at DevOps Belgium. So that's the DevOps conference in Belgium with 3,500 attendees. And my session has about Four or five hundred people in the room, and that was the biggest moment of my career, right at the time. And and here's the thing: I only do live demos. I have, I almost never have slides. Only do live demos, and there's no backup, right? There's no backup for my demos. All right, if it fails, it fails. And I need the internet because I'm showing things on the cloud. And if there's no internet, I'm kind of screwed. So let me just fast forward like my dumb presentation until 14 minutes in, and I think it's about 14 minutes and 26. Uh, just right here, I don't know if you see this, see this, but it says network unreachable. Again, this is probably the biggest moment in my life, <laughs> in my career, in front of 500 people, uh, you know, looking at this thing, I have no backup, and, and look at how, like, unhappy I was. I don't know how else to describe it, just, yeah, this is a sad video, but, <laughs> Luckily, my, my, um, my, my colleague, Frances Campoy, he's based in San Francisco, actually. He was in the audience, and he said, well, don't worry, Ray, give me two minutes. I'll set you up with the phone, and you can tether to my phone. And remind you, we are all from the US. We are all doing international roaming with the data plans. And I'm doing demos on Docker, okay? I have no internet. And I'm like, okay, seriously, do you want me to go do a Docker demo? right, downloading hundreds of megabytes of images over your international plan, data plan, right, over this really, really slow Wi-Fi um, on, the, on the phone. And I was actually able to do it. I actually got through the entire demo without any issues. And then the question is, how did I do it? And that's where a lot of things kind of, you know, kind of, you know, converge together because as I was moving to New York three years ago from California, I, I actually started to prepare for this very moment, right, in this conference where I have no internet, okay? Why do I say that? Because when I moved to New York, I was trying to find the cheapest place possible, right? It is very expensive there, uh, somewhere, I, I guess San Francisco is even more expensive now, but it was very expensive, so I found the smallest and cheapest place I can live in New York City. And I found this awesome place in, on the Craigslist. This is the rendering from the, the post. And we're like, oh wow, this looks awesome. It's got light, it's got windows, it's got blue skies and everything, right? But, but then I quickly realized after I visited the place, this is only a computer rendering. Uh, the real place looks nothing like that. And this place is only about 180 square feet. Okay, 180 square feet, 18 square meters if you're from Europe. And this is the full plan of what it looks like. Uh, <laughs> as you can see, with 180 square feet, you have to meticulously position all of the furniture, otherwise it's just not gonna fit. So here's the door. The door is just right there, okay? And there's, that's the bathroom. It's actually a full bathroom, five by five, with a bathtub and everything, a whirlpool. It's nice. Um, and then it's the closet, just big enough to fit everything I brought with me from California to New York. And the first thing I got for this place was a 50-inch TV. And the TV's width fits perfectly from wall to wall, okay? So it just goes down to the wall, it blocks everything. That's how small this place is, right? And then we have the, the sofa bed, this is where I can sit and sleep and do work. And then the, the, the landlord is like, hey, I got a mini fridge, do you want it? I'm like, yeah, hell yeah, if it fits, I'll take it. So that's what this apartment looks like. Now, the other thing is, this apartment actually came with free Wi-Fi. Yay, it's 900 bucks a month, free Wi-Fi. But one thing I didn't realize is how slow the Wi-Fi was. The landlord was sharing the Wi-Fi in the story above me, in the floor above me, and the Wi-Fi signal only travel this way, right? It doesn't really travel this way. So I have really, really slow Wi-Fi. In fact, it got so bad, 
uh, where I, I'm sitting and you know, doing my work has really bad Wi-Fi. But the only place where I can actually get decent signal is by the bathroom, okay? So I have a choice. I can either stay home and sit by the bathroom and do work <laughs> on the toilet all the time, or I can go out to Starbucks, and that's not any better either, right? And just to put it into perspective how small this place is, this is, since we're doc talking about Docker containers, right? These are standard container sizes. We are 53 feet, 48 feet, 45 feet, 40 feet, and 20 feet. And my apartment fits perfectly well in a container, just like that. Right? That's how big this apartment is, right? I also travel all over the world, so I'm always on the plane. I'm always um, you know, on the move. I'm always on the train, and I do need to do work with container all the time. So what happened is I actually have been training myself to work with container technology with very, very low bandwidth. And this is what I like to share today in terms of what I learned. Because if you ever have done a Docker pool, you'll quickly realize how much data is being pulled down from the internet, right? And if you ever need to do this in a conference or over, the, uh, over uh, Starbucks or something, it's going to take a while. And I was running the older version of Docker on Mac and it has these issues, so. What I almost wanted to do in a, in a coffee shop, and I had enough with this, what a lot of people don't realize is that Docker actually has two components. There is the Docker client, which is the Docker command line that you use on a day-to-day basis. You can do Docker PS, blah, blah, blah. But then there's a Docker daemon that's running as a service, right? It's usually running on your computer, uh, listening to a Unix uh, socket file. So the client communicates with the server via the Unix socket. But what a lot of people don't realize is we can actually expose a Docker server via a public port. You can expose it via HTTP or HTTPS, and you can connect to it securely with certificates, basically. So then what I wanted to do was to create my own Docker server that I can host in the cloud somewhere so that it can do all the heavy liftings of downloading stuff for me while I connect to it via my Docker client. Um, and as I was going down this rabbit hole, uh, very quickly, I found, wait a second, somebody already done this. Uh, there's this thing called Docker Machine. Anyone use Docker Machine before? Anyone? Yeah, a few. But um, if you use Docker Machine, you, you may have been creating a Docker Machine locally. But what you can also do is to create Docker Machine on a remote server as well. You can create a Docker Machine in the cloud. Uh, let me see if this video plays. So I'm just going to show you this very briefly, right? So you can do Docker Machine Create Docker, the name of the machine. Uh, and then the driver, you can give it a different types of driver. You can create it on Google Cloud, you can create it on uh, you know, your own hypervisor, or you can create it on somebody else's cloud provider. And once you do this, right, you can go ahead and get your credentials for that cloud provider and create a Docker machine for you automatically and keeping it up to date as well. And once, you're con uh, once the machine is created, then it's going to be able to configure your Docker client based on using the environmental variables right here to say which IP address do I need to connect to and how do I connect it to it securely via the certificates, okay? So that's the gist of what I have done. And the benefit of it, of course, is when I'm doing the Docker pool, I'm issuing the command from my client, but all the heavy lifting is being done on the server side. Uh, and I don't have to deal with my local VMs on my machines anymore because I'm running a Mac to run Docker on your Linux, Linux VM. It's gotten a lot better, but back then it was just v virtual uh, machines you know, with a virtual box or something, and it was really, really uh, flaky. And of course, I don't have to worry about the network. But that's not entirely true because uh, as I was adapting to a lot of these things, right, to say, okay, now I got my Docker running somewhere else. Um, I can do Docker, let me zoom this in a little bit. Okay, I can do Docker PS, for example. This is actually sending my command to the server, right? Docker PS is sending from my client, sending it to the server. I can do Docker run, of course. Uh, not that one, not that one. Let me, um, oh, Docker run, I don't know, Nginx, for example. Uh, TI and dash dash RM. And that will run Nginx for me, and it's apparently already running. All right, so I can also do a Docker pool, uh, open JDK, I don't know, seven maybe? Right, again, look how fast that is, right? Well, it is obviously fast because all I'm doing is issuing command from my client to the server to do this. 
Now, however, there are some tricks to this, right? As I was adapting my workflow to this, I learned uh, quite a few tips and tricks. Um, and there are some benefits to doing this. If you have a team, for example, that are all using Docker or building Docker containers, rather than having everybody setting up their own uh, Docker daemon on their own machines, what you could potentially do is to share one machine that's configured, and then you can very quickly and easily configure everybody else's machine, no matter what type of architecture they're running on, whether it's Mac, Windows, or Linux, right? It doesn't matter anymore because the daemon is running somewhere else. So it gets, um, it, it's a lot easier to do that. The other thing, thing is when you do a Docker build, and uh, you give it a tag name like, I don't know, my app, and dot, right? What this will actually do is to give or package up everything in this path, in this case, which is the dot, will package up everything and send it to the Docker daemon, okay? So if you have anything that's in here that you don't need or you don't want, you, you don't want it to send it over the wire because otherwise it'll be much, much slower. So for example, if I'm building a, a Java application with Maven, right, I don't send the target directory because if I built it locally already, if I need to make a container out of it, uh, the, the trick I do is I don't send the binary to my Docker daemon. I just send the source code. And you can use something called uh, unbuilt images. Anyone here use unbuilt before? Yeah, so you can use the unbuilt image where you can just send it the source code. And as the Docker container image is being built, it can execute extra build commands to actually create the binary for you, right? So if I do it this way, then I can send over just the source code, which is very, very small, and the daemon can then go ahead and download all the Maven packages for me, uh, com you know, download all the layers for me and such, okay? So that's really useful. But the, the, the neatest thing, the neatest trick I learned is as I needed to get my data to the server and the, getting the data back, right, because this is all running remotely, um, there are two ways to do this. You can either copy the data into a virtual machine, right, and then run Docker command locally, and then mount the volume on the virtual machine uh, to refer to the data, the, the, the blobs that you just uploaded, right? Because the data is actually need to reside with Docker uh, where the server is running. But I'm lazy, I don't wanna do that every single time. What I quickly found out is every Docker process, right, is just another process. And as a process, it actually can take in STD in and STD out. This is, again, something that a lot of people don't realize, right? Because in local commands, what you can do is you can say um, ls, right? You can, uh, or you can do like find, right, dot, and you can do grip uh, for, I don't know, Java, and you can do account, right? So you can pipe the data through, and you can do exactly the same thing with the Docker daemon as well. So I, anyone here know Deep Dream? Uh, Google Deep Dream? Google Deep Dream, yeah, maybe? So this is like uh, one of the things that they, they made to, uh, let me see if I can find anything here. It's one of the things that they made to kind of help researchers to peek into what the machine learning algorithm is, is doing. So for example, uh, they're doing something with uh, uh, image recognition, right? So with this image, you can actually feed it through Deep Dream and you can kind of see what the machine is seeing instead, right? So it's, it's going to generate these very dreamy pictures uh, based on just uh, the one image that you give it. Now, this image, however, this, this deep drink thing uh, uses TensorFlow and a bunch of other machine learning stuff, and it's really, really hard to run on your local machine. You have to set everything up. So what I wanted to do then is to actually get this thing running in a Docker container. So I don't have to set this thing up over and over again. So in my container, I set up Python and a bunch of other utilities and the deep dream source code, and I make sure everything compiles. And now I can just run Deep Dream directly in the container. But what I also wanted to do was to be able to, you know, run this through some images. Like I said, I can either do it by uploading the image to the server and run it, or I can actually use the piping. So let me just show you the last demo I'm going to do here. Uh, let's go find a picture of a cat. Okay, let's go destroy some cat. Okay, so I'm going to go to images. Let's find a cat. Nice picture of a cat. And let me just go to tools, make sure it I have the, let's see, what is this? Label for you, reuse with modification, because we're gonna destroy it. All right, which one should we take? Oh, that one's cute. All right, let's do this one. So I'm going to save this file, uh, save the image, and I'm gonna call cat.jpg, okay? Then what I can do is, this is fun, 
So I can, I can basically cat the cat, <laughs> no pun intended, right? You can cat the file, right, which will send it through the output stream, and I can pipe that output stream into my Docker container as well, and I need to get back the data, right? Because this is gonna do some machine learning processing, it's going to look into what, what the machine is seeing, so rather than just getting the image in, oh, there's a lot of it, rather than just getting the image in, I also need to get the image out. Again, I can do this just by SCP or SSH, but this is a lot more convenient because I can not just, let me show you the command line again. Oh, no, I don't have it here. Uh, what I can do is I can pipe the data in, and then also I can get the STD out, and I can direct that string into, uh, basically into a file if I want to. So it's a very, it's a very convenient way for me to uh, work with Docker and Docker machines, especially in the context where I need to have a very low bandwidth usages on my side uh, and let the uh, machine, the cloud, doing the heavy lifting, and, uh, and I can actually just you know, use this, these command lines as if it was directly on my own machine. So thank you very much for your time, and uh, if we have, um, if this actually finishes in, ah, there it is. If it finishes, let me open up the output, and there's the cat that just got deep dreamed. <laughs> so. Thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm.